How it started with me actually was really a crisis of faith. Um, hell never made sense to me. It just never really made sense. But, you know, we were told his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And I guess that includes torture too. So uh, I just never questioned it. And then, but I always saw it in the Bible. Like since I was, I, tried, I became a Christian when I was 2003, uh, became a pastor in 2009. Um, but I always saw those verses and I would sit and ponder them, but I'd always just tell myself that just can't mean what it means, you know, especially the first Timothy verse where it is his desire that all men should be saved and come to the full knowledge of truth. Like I would read that and ponder it, but I wasn't, I wasn't allowing myself to really think that that could possibly be what it means. So finally, um, about five years ago, I went through a crisis of faith and I started reading the early church fathers. And I saw that was a very prominent view among them. Um, and then as soon as I started studying Orthodox perspective on heaven and hell, how they believe that it's the same place, like it's just the kingdom, everyone's resurrected. Some people aren't enjoying the new kingdom yet because they have been haters of God, but they're still there. And that fit perfectly with Revelation at the end of Revelation to me, where the gates are never shut and the spirit and the bride say, come, you know. So that was that was huge for me just to start reading the early church fathers, uh, the Cappadocian fathers, um, even Augustine. Like there's things Augustine would say that sounded really universalistic. <laughs> and then, you know, he kind of went the opposite direction towards the end of his life. But I didn't even know that was um, allowed. I didn't know that was allowed. And Rob Bell's book came out. I bought it, read it on an airplane to Vegas, and I just looked at it to try to um, destroy it. I was told that it was heresy before I read it. So I went in to prove that it's wrong. And then I reread it uh, about five years after it came out. And I just, I honestly couldn't, I don't think it's the best book on Universalism either, but I couldn't defend against some of the things he was saying and the things he was laying out. So as much as disagreements I still have with him on some things, I do think he opened that door for people to at least think about it. So Universalism actually, or Ultimate Reconciliation kind of saved my faith. So I don't know if it was an exact moment, but there were little moments along the way um luke 15 was huge for me that was huge for me because when i finally just looked at the pattern of a lost coin the lost coin did nothing <laughs> it just was lost and the woman found it and that coin never lost that value it was it wasn't not a coin because it was lost and then you go to the lost sheep what does the lost sheep do it's so clear he's like 99 righteous ones there's a reason there's a number there you know for the one so i looked at that as like in the bigger cosmic scheme of things he's not going to let one go away he's not going to let one perish um, and then finally that helped me get into the prodigal son story um, which is a hinge story and we've always made that story about the younger brother the more i read that story now I'm way more concerned for the older brother than the younger brother in that story because I really started seeing the older brother in myself. And I think universalism exposes the older brother syndrome in you because I started seeing people really mad that everyone might get in. And I'm like, why would you be mad at that? <laughs> you know? So when I reversed the prodigal son story to look more at the older brother, that was huge for me because it, and then in the Greek, even with the younger brother, it says the father died and the younger brother died. They died. <laughs> the younger brother was dead. What did dead people do? They do nothing. They do nothing. Dead people can't do anything. So Christ resurrects them because that's what he does. He is the savior. So it was just a pattern that went along the way. And then finally, when I realized, you know, Gregory of Nyssa is the father of fathers and he was a universalist, that gave me um, a little more confidence in talking about these things. So when I was in the middle of this, um, two things, my wife grew up Assemblies of God. So this was heresy. And my wife was really struggling with this when I was bringing it up. But my wife always kind of believed it. It's really weird. Um, so I had a really cool moment with my wife that affirmed it too. She was reading by herself the, the lost sheep, lost coin, prodigal son story in her devotionals. And she just came into the room one day. She just said, I get it, Scott. I get it. He leaves the 99 for the one. And it means everyone is precious to him and you know and so that was a big moment for her and me and now she's all into it and she's like yeah i've always kind of believed this one day i was so confused on this subject and i was getting so much hate from people even talking about it that i remembered that verse where jesus said you must be like a child like to understand kingdom things you have to be like a child that's really what he was saying and so i've 
just point blank asked my daughter who was about 10 at the time she's 14 now i just said honey like you believe jesus is good right she goes yeah of course and i just said you believe that like jesus loves people and all kinds of stuff and you know because we had never talked about hell with our children ever talk about it which is probably says a lot right but i finally just said well do you believe he's gonna some people are going to go to a, a place of fire someday and they're going to be kind of tortured and he's going to leave them there and she, that look on her face man uh it was like i betrayed her it was like i had betrayed her that i had been sharing for 10 years this beautiful picture of jesus and his grace and his love and his forgiveness and then at 10 years old i dropped this bomb on her that he is going to burn some people and he's going to leave some people and he's going to torture some people and it looked she looked at me like i had worms growing out of my ears like it was so foreign to her that jesus would ever do anything like that and so that probably was my moment where i at least felt comfortable with it because i'm like if this little kid gets this and she she hasn't been polluted by sin and politics and life and all that stuff then i should probably listen to this kid so if if little kids think Jesus is that good, then I should think Jesus is that good. So that was a really defining moment for me thinking, yes, it, that one, it was weird to my daughter that I would even describe God in that way. <laughs> so that if my daughter, if I can't explain the gospel to a little kid, then I've done a horrible job. And so we have done a horrible job. And I think that was telling for me that if my daughter believes that Jesus is that good, then she probably knows Jesus better than I do at this point in her life. And I should listen to her.